Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode, I'm thrilled to have a conversation with Bijan Aga to discuss why many autistics relate to superheroes, her comic of a transgender Muslim superhero, and identity exploration. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Jan, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. And I'd like to start out all of these uh, conversations here on Autism Stories by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? Well, that's a very interesting question because I've obviously been autistic my whole life, but I didn't know that until I was an adult. And looking back, it seems obvious, right? Because, you know, I've always had very intense special interests and I've always thought and, you know, I always think in a different way. But a lot of people didn't notice that I was autistic because I'm so good at eye contact and inflecting my voice. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that it was, it was two major things. One was that my grandmother who raised me is deaf. And so she used sign language and so you have to look in the other person's eyes in order to communicate. So I was trained very early on to look at someone's eyes while they communicate due to the sign language. So I was able to learn that very early on. And then another thing is that one of my special interests is communication. I really like acting and writing and things like that. So, so my whole life, I've been very good at masking, to be frank, because I'm so good at replicating the habits and mannerisms of other people, because one of my special interests is, like I said, acting and communication. I didn't, uh, until I was an adult, I didn't know I was autistic. I first really started putting it together in my 20s when I, I was doing research on autism due to the fact that I'm gluten intolerant, because that's, there, there's a lot of uh, overlap. And so when I started looking into causes of uh, gluten intolerance, autism popped up. I started learning more about it. I'd never really done any research up until that point. I'd really just taken, you know, the mainstream media, you know, the Rain Man kind of a thing. That's That was my only understanding of it. And it wasn't until I really started delving into it, I go, oh, my God, that's that's me. You're describing who I am. So it wasn't until I was, yeah, it was in my 20s that I really started reaching out to other people and realizing that a lot of people that I had gotten close to over the years were also discovering for themselves that they were autistic at this time too because in the 90s there's no internet there's no communication there's very little ability to do research outside the library and then mid 2000s 2010s things really start opening up and people start seeing themselves in these diagnoses and yeah so i got diagnosed and it's been a lot easier to navigate life now because i have friends and family who are also known to be autistic and we're able to communicate in ways that are easier for us. We don't have to pretend to be holistic. It's been a, quite the journey, but quite the journey. Now, you are the creator of an independent comic, Time Wars, The Adventure of Cobra Olympus. Now, this, this comic is the story of a transgender Muslim superhero. So I was, I was very excited to uh, learn about you know, this comic. Why was it so important for you to make a comic about a superhero who is transgender and Muslim? Well, I am also transgender, so that's a huge part of it, is that I, it's a very long-standing tradition in the comics history to write what you know, right? So, for example, Peter Parker was very much drawn from Stan Lee's personal experiences with not being able to pay the rent and having girl problems and cars always broken and, you know, families always on your butt. 
So I wanted to follow in that tradition and write about issues and ways of life that were important to me. I've always loved comic. I, I remember as a kid, we didn't have money for new comics, but we had the local library. And the local library had these giant printed, they were like, they were maybe about 100 comics each. And they had these flimsy little covers and they were printed on this yellow pulp paper. And it was only black and white. None of the color made it through the process. I used to go and I'd read these and it was like classic Wonder Woman, 70s Spider-Man, like just the best of the best. But when it came time to tell my own story, because I'm bigger now and it's time to tell the world you know, more about who I am and, and where I'm coming from, I wanted to do it in that same tradition, in that same vein. So I wanted to create a character that wasn't exactly like me. She, Cobra's pretty different from me. Like one, one, she's smarter, she's funnier, she's more athletic, right? So she's pretty different from me, but I tried to bring my own best attributes and my own worst attributes to her and so that I can relate to the character in a very natural way. For example, Peter Parker was a great way to normalize talking about poverty because Peter Parker's always poor and people were starting to say, oh, you know, if, if Spider-Man can be poor and it's normal, then we don't have to be ashamed either, right? And it's the same thing with any other concept. When a superhero is gay, when a superhero is black, when a superhero is a woman, that, that signals to people that you can be a hero, you can be great, you can be magnificent just the way you are. So that's why it was really important to me that Cobra Olympus as a superhero was mixed race and transgender because we're really missing in society the commonly held belief that these things are okay, which they are. We need to tell more stories about trans people by trans people. Absolutely. And, and what about, you know, you were talking about the, the main character, Cobra. Can you tell us a little bit about the storyline, the plot of Time Wars, the adventures of Cobra Olympus? Oh, so um, we're, just so the listeners know, I can't actually hear what Doug is saying. I'm, I'm relying on closed captionings, and I just lost the last bit. You asked me about why Cobra was important, but the last bit didn't come through. Yeah, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the storyline, the plot of Time Wars, the adventures of Cobra Olympus? Oh, yeah. So Time Wars was a story that I came up with when I was playing a lot of tabletop role-playing games with my friends. And we were playing lots of really weird ones. We were coming up with, we would play it, uh, the Ninja Turtle ones where you can mutate your character every which way. It's the Star Trek one where you have to focus on your skills. And they really wanted to start a new story, but we didn't know what universe we wanted it to be set in. We put a bunch of ideas in a hat and I pulled out some random words that they had contributed. And the words that came up were time travel, vampires, and superheroes. We came up with this role-playing game where you would make a team of time travelers with superpowers and you'd go back in time and actively try to rewrite history to improve it, to stop the vampires from taking control. Because the vampires have always existed on Earth and they're intertwined with our history, so we can't just get rid of them. But we have to slowly eliminate their influence mission by mission. So that's what started as a tabletop role-playing game, which it's free on itch.io. If you want to go to itch.io and search for Time Wars, Time Core, C-O-R-P-S, it is a free PDF. We are working on the second edition right now. It's going to have some beautiful artwork, but the first edition is free right now. But it evolved over time. We're working on a video game set in the same universe, and it just made sense to make a comic once it was time to to work with this amazing artist, uh, Swap Trap, S-W-A-P-T-R-A-P. -A -A He's from India. He's amazing. He's influenced by hip hop art and comic book art, and he has such a diverse array of, of styles. And so, you know, when I started working with him, I really had this idea of a trans character, and she's being given messages from the future. And those messages are guiding her on how to defeat monsters that live in the current time. Working with him and fleshing out the story and the characters, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. And so this first story that we're talking about, the comic book, we, we're planning for six issues. But this first story that we have on Kickstarter right now, it is just a little glimpse into a little, little bit of action and a bit, little bit of her love life. We wanted to hold the biggest and most explosive stories for once we've gotten to know the character. But right now we've got a really fun little action sequence we got a beautiful date scene and it all wraps up in a really cute way with 
well, I don't want to give any spoilers, but everyone's going to love the last two pages. But it's very cute. It's very fun. It's very much inspired by the most classic adventures of like classic superheroes. I really didn't want to do the decompressed storytelling thing where you can go three or four pages and they've maybe said four or five things. I really wanted to do the more classic fast paced adventures where every page is a story beat and you start something new and you end something that thing on the same page. So it's going to have a brisk pace. It's going to have a very classic feel. The artwork is all inspired by mid-century masters like Bill Everett and Harry G. Peter. I'm very excited about this. You can go to kickstarter.com and search for Cobra Olympus. That's Cobra with a K, Cobra Olympus. And it's going to be right there on the, on the page for you. Earlier, you were talking about Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And, you know, I think for a lot of autistic people, we feel connected to the story of superheroes. I'm wondering for you in what ways superhero identities uh, may have had a positive impact on your life. Oh, that's such a beautiful question. I remember that there were two two major influences, right? Because when I because I was growing up in the early '90s, when the two biggest things on TV, the three biggest things on TV were Batman, Power Rangers, and Ninja Turtles. Those are the big three. And they both had such different ways of addressing secret identities. Because Batman, right, he's Bruce Wayne during the day, and he puts on the cowl at night, and he becomes Batman. And he has this very strict delineation between who Batman is and who Bruce Wayne is. And people don't know that one is the other. So he has this very compartmentalized, it's very much like autism masking, right? He has a literal physical mask he puts on. And then he goes out and he does what he what he wants to do. And then you have the Power Rangers. And the Power Rangers are more like a group of autistic friends because they do mask for other people, right? They keep their identity secret to other people, but they all know who each other are. In the middle of battle, they're not calling out each other's superhero names. They're calling out each other's actual names, right? They know who each other are and they're all collaborating. So there was this idea of you can still mask, but you can also have a community. And then the Ninja Turtles are something else entirely. The Ninja Turtles refuse to mask. They wear masks, but then what are they going to do? This little domino mask over a turtle face. They look like turtles. They're basically a group of autistic friends who refuse to mask for other people. They're just going to go out and they're just going to go be the freaks that they know they are inside deep down. And they're just going to let that freak flag fly. And they're going to love who they are and love what they're doing. And accept every and the other thing is that they encounter all these other wild, amazing creatures, and they never flinch. They're like, "Oh, you're a potato monster. Great, welcome to the club." You know, they don't care at all. So, they all three had very different ways of helping me view different situations I could be in. For example, when I'm in a corporate office and I'm you know have to work an office job, I'm Batman. When I'm hanging out with my friends and we're just all loving each other and we have to make sure we don't look too weird out at the coffee shop then we're all the power rangers and when we decide that we've had enough and we're just going to go be as weird as possible and we're just going to play all the games we like and just do whatever we want now we're the ninja turtles so superhero identities really gave me a way to think about and communicate and navigate masking and having to be a weirdo in a society where you're expected to be the most boring, bland person in the world. Now, earlier you mentioned about just seeing, a, you know, lots of different types of stories. And I really love seeing media where the lead characters who have identities that are often um, not represented enough. So that makes me think of your superhero, whose one of their identities is being Muslim. How do you see the intersection of your Muslim and autistic identities? That's very interesting. So something that I feel very strongly about is that modern mainstream Islam has strayed very far from where it used to be in the past. And where it used to be in the past was much more progressive. So, for example, being gay and non-binary and being trans was actually very well accepted and very well understood uh, a thousand years ago in Islam. 
And it's only because of change with time that we've lost those things. Those things have been eroded away. When I look back at the history of Islam, I see people in the past who are much more open-minded and accepting and much more free-thinking than the people who are thought leaders in Islam today. And I think those are the heroes that we need to look to, the people in the past who have championed these things. And I mean, even Muhammad himself had a queer friend. It's hard to say whether today they would have been considered a gay man or a trans woman because of the concepts, cultural concepts of the time. But Muhammad himself had friends and no, and knew people and accepted people who were of non-binary gender and other sexual orientations. So the idea that modern mainstream Islam is rejecting these things is antithetical to the religion, in my opinion. When I look at the history of creativity, of science, of being a hero in the world, I see a lot of positive Muslim examples. Malcolm X is a very recent example of someone who took on the Muslim faith, uh, Muhammad Ali, they took on the Muslim faith, and they were able to make humongous changes in the world due to the combination of their faith and their ability to navigate the secular world. What I want to do with this story is to bring to bring to the table the idea that being a queer Muslim is no more strange than being a queer Christian or atheist or Jewish person that these are totally normative ways of being. And like I said, in the past, it would have been widely accepted. It's uh, a hard thing because I don't think I'm going to get much acceptance in the Muslim community. And I really feel like, like that's what we need more than anything right now. And if I can reach anyone, if I want to reach anyone, I really want to be able to reach the queer Muslims out there who think that this world isn't for them, who think that there's no space for them in this world and let them know that we do have a space for them and that there is a, a place that they can go in, even if just in their mind where they can be a superhero, where they can change the world. And hopefully we can come together and make that a reality. Do you have a sense of why like things have changed over the last 1,000 years? Why there's less acceptance than there used to be in the Muslim faith? It would be simplistic to say that it was an erosion of Eastern values in the face of Western imperialism. There is certainly an aspect of that in that many Muslim countries were colonized by European powers and Christian ways of thinking about sex and gender were introduced, right? But that's not the only factor either, because there was also influence from the East as well in China and Russia having trade relations and again, normalizing their own concepts of sex and gender. So I would say that it was, it was mostly a pressure cooker situation where there was for this brief oasis of a moment, a period of time where Muslims were able to think clearly about gender and sexuality in isolation. But then the pressures of the world came in and slowly over time began eroding those things and over and over and over. And I think also a lot of it has to do with poverty too, because in a poorer society, there's more emphasis on marriage as a business contract. Whereas in a richer society, people don't necessarily need to get married in order for social customs to proceed. If someone is significantly wealthy, then marriage is almost irrelevant as a contract because then they don't need anything from the contract. I think there was also an aspect of a richer society of Islam at its peak had sort of the social security to explore less traditional ways of maintaining relationships. So I think there's there's a lot of factors. It wasn't any one thing. It was a fact, it was a lot of a, a pressure from the outside world, East and West. It was affluence that is no longer there. And it was the pressures of poverty that make people want to get married in a traditional way rather than having the freedom to explore other options. So yeah, it wasn't wasn't any one thing, but it was a lot of different things. Now, I think as autistic people, we're more likely to explore our identities because so many of the social constructs of our society don't make a whole lot of sense to us. So what did the process of your identity exploration look like to help you understand that you're transgender? Well, you know, I actually 
as a kid, everyone knew I was a soft boy, right? Everyone knew that I was gentle and tender. And everyone just assumed that I was a boy who was tender, right? And I think a lot of people just assumed I'd be a gay man. But I always had traditionally masculine interests, right? I always liked science fiction and action movies. I didn't like sports, but the things that I liked had a lot of muscly dudes in them and swinging guns and swords. Conan the Barbarian, loved that movie. <clears throat> and again, probably contributing to the idea that people thought I'd be a gay man. But it was actually, I really had this very rigid sense of myself as a straight man for a very long time, even though I was willing to accept others for not being so. I was willing to accept others for being different, but I wasn't able to accept that in myself for a very long time. And it wasn't until one day when I, my life was at a very low point, I had just broken up with a long-term partner. I was on my way to a job I hated using public transit that I hated. And I just asked myself the question, what would it look like if you were happy? And when I closed my eyes and imagined it, I was wearing a dress. And so, you know, I, that was my first big breakthrough moment. And when I realized, oh, that there's something queer here, like there's something really queer here. And another thing is that we often only hear about trans women who are straight, who like men. But I very much like feminine people, not exclusively women, but anyone who's very feminine. I had to encounter other trans lesbians to realize, oh, that's a that's a thing you can do. That's, you know, that's an option. Once I started accepting myself coming out to people, actually through dating sites, because I didn't know any other way to reach out to people, but I began reaching out to people to see if I could just hang out with them and talk to them, just get to know them who were trans or queer or some, you know, anything like that. And when I finally did, you know, I didn't end up dating any of them. But when I finally did, I, I was, you know, really starting to come to understand that this whole thing is so much more wide and broad than any of the narrow stereotypes I'd encountered in the past. And that a lot of the things that I had simply never considered as options were perfectly normal in the queer community. So yeah, it was really, there were lots of signs before, but there was that one moment of clarity that really broke the dam and then everything came flooding through, just learning more about other people and then how that related to myself. And lastly, uh, how can our listeners learn more about you and your comic beyond this interview? All right. So my comic is on Kickstarter. It is Cobra Olympus, Cobra with a K. It is, we're doing the first issue, which is the Battle of the Blood Golem. She's going up against a terrific monster. Uh, we got some beautiful surprises in there for you. Some really funny moments, some action-packed moments. There's some romance. There's lots of great things. The colors are beautiful. We are we're doing this for a print run. So on kickstarter.com, if you support the project, you're supporting the printing of the first issue. And we're trying to get up to 400 copies printed, and then we'll have met our goal. Uh, you can back the project for $2 for a digital comic or $6 for a physical comic, and that'll be shipped out to you. Uh, it'll be bagged and boarded. We've already done a print run, a test print run with the company that's going to be doing it, and they are beautiful. The covers are glossy, the paper is thick, and the inks are uh, just, they pop. It's amazing. So if you want to back that project, I think it's a great idea. It'll be, help us get, make more issues in the future, and we'll get to see more adventures of Cobra Olympus. So that's Cobra Olympus with a K on kickstarter.com. Well, Bijan, I, I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you today and, lo and learning more about your comic. And I will be checking out your Kickstarter and uh, promoting it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I had a great time talking about all this. Thank you so much to Bijan for the conversation. To learn more about Bijan and her comic, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. At Autism Personal Coach, we provide customized coaching for autistics to help improve the quality of our lives. If you would like to learn more about our coaching, please visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it, 
so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories. It would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.